Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Comeback Stories with my man, Donnie Starkins, as always. We've got an amazing guest here today. we got my boy. Uh, you may know him as a receiver for the Jacksonville Jaguars. I just know him as a great man, man of God, a brother, a friend, uh, Mr. <laughs> Isaiah Zay Jones <laughs> in the building. What's up, What's Zay? up, brother? What's up, gentlemen? What's going on? Not too much, man. Blessed to have you on here. Blessed to have you in the city. Uh, yeah. You've been missed. Uh, Raider Nation, this is one of our beloved guys man <laughs> missed this guy dear, dearly this year just as a as a as a person in the presence in the locker room uh dearly missed bro but grateful to have you here uh let's dive right in man what was uh what was life like for you growing up as a kid shoot man uh blessing uh two parents married same household uh, very fortunate a lot of kids running around i'm one of six two brothers three sisters got an older brother caleb younger brother levi leah priscilla and anna my sisters we adopted Anna from China. She's been a huge blessing in addition to our family. Um, but that's just what I know, my family. It means everything to me. Uh, football has always been a part of me and who I am. My father played for 10 years in the league, uh, started in 92 with the Dallas Cowboys, played four years with them, transitioned to St. Louis Rams. People know them now as Los Angeles Rams. Uh, but Miami Dolphins as well for a few more years after that and then finished up with the Washington Redskins, or now what we know as the Commanders. <laughs> yeah. But um, football's just been in my blood, man, for as long as I could remember. And it's just been a big part of who I am. No doubt. So I grew up in a household with two kids, so I couldn't imagine what six kids was like. Was it a very competitive environment? Uh, maybe like fighting for attention? Like how did, how did that all work? Um, I mean, yeah, it was, it was super competitive, uh, especially when it came to the video game. You know, like old NCAA when they were still making it and, and Madden and things like that. But um, we, we loved each other. Um, I think the only person I fought with the most was my older brother just because I wanted to be like him so much. And and just the statue, how I saw him and how I perceived him. Um, but we were just so close-knit. I think my parents did a phenomenal job of um, raising that many kids. I remember just the discipline that they instilled in us. Even when we would go to restaurants and things like that, people would be like, are these all your kids and they're so well behaved and you, you don't really realize the importance of that until you know you become an adult and you see children you're around ch children and things like that and so yes it was competitive but we loved each other we always had each other each other's backs and we're, they're truly my best friends mm. we love asking um who was a, a a great teacher for you growing up in some cases positive negative depending on how somebody's childhood was but it really sounds like that was your dad or your parents. Like, what were some of the, the principles and just, uh, you know, character qualities that they instilled in you that you still live by? Yeah, definitely. It's a great question. When people ask me, like, who are your heroes? It's definitely my parents for multiple reasons. I mean, I could start with my mom um, leaving school to, you know, marry the man of her dreams and then raising six kids. And then for that matter, she, my mom did homeschooling for us. Like she, she taught me Spanish. Latin, how to multiply, how to divide, wow. and did that with six kids, and and it's just such an incredible thing that she was doing. Like I was mentioning earlier, and just how amazing she is to do that, you know, and, and instill love, teach us about character, teach us about integrity, teach us, you know, right from wrong. All of us, you know, in the same household, and not everyone was obedient all the time, and, and so I just have a heart and a love for who she is as a woman and just how intelligent and how smart she was to hold down the fort in the household. And then my dad has an incredible story, um, came from a tumultuous background with his family, you know, losing brothers, um, brothers dying, um, you know, his father murdering his mother and growing up really with not a whole lot of guidance, just trying to figure it out. And makes it out of a situation he's not supposed to make it out of and um, uses an avenue of football to to provide and make something of himself when he shouldn't have been there. And I just really – I could dive deeper into all of that stuff, mm -hmm. but I can really admire where he's gotten. But it's not just about Super Bowl rings, which he has three of, but, like, the character and integrity of him, um, the faithfulness he has to his wife, my mother, um, the commitment he has to his kids to see them succeed. There's so many qualities of my parents that I could only hope to be um, as a man one day and 
those two would definitely be my heroes the, mm. for those reasons. No doubt. I see how present your parents are just from the few times that I've been around them. They're just always there and they yeah. want to be around you and just be there with you. So shout out to shout out to all the parents out there that are really, uh, you know, carrying that burden for their children, uh, doing whatever's necessary. Um, and for the fact that they overcome what they, the cars that they were dealt, like we have our mental health issues. We have our, our issues that we're fighting to overcome and be better men, but they didn't always have examples for to how, how to overcome, but here your dad is yeah. through all he's been through your mom as well being able to overcome and provide a good example, provide a good childhood for you. Like we got to shout out to parents real quick, man. Just, exactly. Just, you know, let, hold them down with respect. Exactly. Exactly. But um, even with my parents were tremendous as well. Um, but for me, I still experienced a lot of pain growing up uh, outside of the household. Like for me, like it was not being black enough and just being a lot different than kids. My skin color looked and just like for just, a, I was a weird kid, you know what I'm saying? But I was mm -hmm. interested in a lot of things and that was uh, hard for people to digest, I guess. Is there an early memory of pain for you that may have changed your perspective a little bit from just social groups or whatever sure. it was that may have impacted you in a way? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I think I could touch on a few things here. Um, I think for one, how well-spoken uh, we were as, as young kids. Um, you know, it was it was kind of like, you know, why do you talk white? Mm -hmm. It's like, Facts. Well, what does that mean? Because I know how to speak or I know how to pronounce words or, you know, things like that. Or, you know, if I had my shirt tucked in because I went to a private school and as I transitioned to public school, it was it was a little different right. at first. Or like he, you know, he hangs with the white kids, you know, but he doesn't have black friends or he's not diverse, or he comes from money because his dad played mm. in the league that, like, he's not one of, he's not one of us because he doesn't really understand right. what we go through, you know? So I, th I think that was definitely there, um, not only for me, but for all of my siblings. Um, I think that we lived in a very affluent neighborhood um, in Austin, Texas. I grew up in Austin, Texas. And we were kind of, you know, the accepted black family so to speak you know uh we're not a threat or anything <laughs> like that you know yep. and yep. and it's crazy because as time had gone on um some things had happened to my family you know some a lot of stuff had gone on there was legal trouble with with kids and there was you know instances where my dad was getting blamed for stuff that he didn't do which actually he um overcame that but you started to see how those people who we're so infatuated that my dad played for the Cowboys and had all these kids and we're so talented and loved us and invited us over and everything was great, turned into, uh, I'm not gonna re respond to their call anymore. Or, yeah, we, we knew them, you know, but we're not, really, we're not really close to them, mm -hmm. you know? So there definitely was that um, from a standpoint of how we were viewed, what we were accepted for, but what we were still shunned as so there's definitely that and I think personally for me a lot of pain came from the fact that as a young kid I didn't know how to oftentimes manage you know my dad played pro 10 years three Super Bowl rings my older brother is a five-star recruit by the way he committed to Texas uh, basically like his freshman sophomore year so like they had all of this this glory in a sense, and I was like a little runt. I didn't really hit a growth spurt until my freshman year of college, and I struggled with feeling sort of inferior or not seen. Mm -hmm. um, and then as time went on, I began to channel um, that feeling of being overlooked or not being as good as my brother or my dad, having those expectations. Well, your dad did this and your brother did this. What's wrong with you? Right. You know? Um, and looking back, like that, that's, that was really stupid for people to even say because, you know, football doesn't define you. It's something I, I wanted to do and I love, and I'm grateful for how I came up. But like, I, my dad would have supported me if I was like, Pop, I don't want to play ball. I want to I wanna play the piano. Or he would have just been like, do your best then. Be the best at it. And so um, I was looked at sort of differently because I wasn't a five star recruit or six foot tall at an early age like both of my brothers were. So 
I definitely had a lot of pain and insecurity that came from feeling kind of outcasted in that sense. I'm just <clears throat> thinking about the knowing your story, the the not black enough story, which it oh, yeah. sounds like exact is a very same. similar exact story same. to yours, which I have to imagine you guys have shared these similar stories and probably why you guys have a, a, a pretty solid bond. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting that 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 not enough. That's basically what it is. The story you had mentioned, my dad's in the studio today and he's got a shirt on that says love yourself. Yeah. And this is kind of like a theme that I've had. And I have retreats that are named love yourself and shirts. And this is why it's because there's a common, like a universal problem that I see. And it's that we're not enough, that we don't love yeah. ourselves enough. And so when that wound is being hit, like, you know, it's being validated. You're the runt. You're not, you're not, um, you're not meeting the expectations that other people have of you, like of your own size. Yeah. So you're constantly being hit. Your wound of not enough is being hit like nonstop. And it's, it's hard because I remember what, everything you said was, was very pure. And I agree. And I, I just remember like not being able to gain weight, you know, fast enough and all these things. And I couldn't play varsity and it was things I couldn't even really control. Yeah. And it psyched me out because I thought I was doing something wrong. Mm. And that's dangerous because I completely believe that God's timing is perfect. And it's easier said than done to trust that, right, and have faith in that. When your identity is rooted in, in the wrong things and you're forcing something, like, I can't make myself taller. And I, I, I every, you know, all everybody would be six two, six whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like it's just it was just my process. And I feel like it's so beautiful because that maturation of actually my physical growth, I saw me mature as a man in time too as, as well, if that makes any sense. And so I just remember feeling so doubted, um, a deep deep rooted insecurity of feeling like I'm a failure, um, and I had to combat those feelings. Um, some of them, not the greatest emotions, maybe expressed, and they did help in a sort of sense, but as I got older, I learned, okay, which, which emotions are actually good for me now? Like, I don't have to walk around thinking the world is against me anymore. I don't have to carry that, you know? So I can channel um, things in the right direction for myself and, and come with a better perspective but definitely at a younger age it's hard to kind of sift through all of all of those emotions especially in your adolescent years you know so many things are going on in your mind how did you navigate through it or who who helped you was it your faith yeah was it a combination of all of that i i, I my parents um instilled faith in me um grew up grew up in the church but like it's not just like i grew up in the church the church has my relationship with God, my relationship mm. with Christ, my relationship being rooted in the right things. And it wasn't perfect by any stretch of the means. I'm still not perfect. But consistent faith in that I'm going to be taken care of, right? I'm going to be taken care of by the Most High. He's going to, he's going to take care of me. Um, faith without works is dead, right? So practicing great habits. And actually, when things look bleak and things look dark, you still go anyways. Right. My dad did a phenomenal job of um, instilling being disciplined, being on time and hard work for sure. I remember school would start for us at like nine o'clock. My dad would have us, first of all, up in the morning, but he would have us legit there like six thirty, six forty five. And we had extra time. Right. So it's like, what do I do with this time? You know. When I realized that kids were rolling out of bed hours later, like eight, eight, <laughs> eight thirty it almost became sort of my superpower that I began to like package because I would go to the weight room with my coach. Um, shout out Mike Rosenthal, by the way. I would go to the weight room with my coach and I would, I would work out, I would train. I would find something to try to get better at, you know, um, whether it was squatting, whether it was running, and I consistently did that. Uh, my dad oftentimes, I'm so grateful he did this, but he would say, go outside, don't come, be don't come back in the house until I tell you to. And so it's like, Okay, so what do we do? Do we mess around? Do we do we go BS around, or do we do we find something beneficial to work on? So I would get ladders, and I, like um, speed ladders, agility ladders, and I'll put them down on the ground, and I'll work agility. We had this hill in Barton Creek, um, in the front of our house, and I would run the hill. I would do push-ups 
in between commercials. And my mom loves that story, but it's very true. Like if I watch TV show, I would just do push. I was trying to find something through being productive. I think oftentimes it's misinterpreted that patience is like you sitting back and you waiting. Well, okay, it could also be seen as wasting time. Patience could be you actively pursuing something while not forcing what's going on. Mm -hmm. You can still be devoted to your craft and letting it come in its perfect timing, its perfect place, but you're still being proactive as you're getting to that end goal. And so I didn't, I didn't really sit on my hands. I, 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 I just worked, right? And I understand it's not all by my doing, too, and I think that's the balance of the God I, at least I serve, right? It's like I know in my head I didn't do it all. It's not all about Zay, but there is beauty in my craftsmanship and working and giving him glory in the process of achieving my goals. And so that just came in time, and I'm super, super fortunate and super blessed to, to have that perspective now. Yeah, I believe that faith relieves us from the burden of excessive responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. To be able to have God, higher power, universe, whatever you choose sure. to call it, something to give it up to, right? Or to let go or to be able to trust the timing where God's timing may be slow, but he's never late. Yeah. But to have that instilled in you, when you go back to your, the not enough story, like what would you say was your, what did, where did that story take you? Like what was your bottom? What was the lowest of the lows if you look back on your life and when was that? Um, gosh. I mean, so I remember going into multiple let me back up. My, my brother had all these offers, right? His name is Caleb Jones. He was like top two receiver, I think, in the nation. I think only behind Doriel, Doriel Green Beckham. Yeah, I remember. And um, I think maybe Stefan Diggs. It was like they were, they were the top three. And so I would go on all these recruiting trips, right? I would go to Texas with Caleb. I would go to, to, to Baylor, to, to TC, where, whatever it was. And I constantly got reminded of, we want your brother, you know, you can come watch the games, but we're not here for you. You, you know what I'm saying? And it was like, hey, we're going to give you recruiting tickets, but, you know, we're, we're not seriously interested in you. And I remember even Texas, if we go back, I remember the Acho brothers, uh, the Vaccaro brothers. I remember the Shipley brothers. Um, I remember the McCoy brothers. I remember all these brothers, right, who went to the Univer University of Texas. And growing up in the backyard of the Longhorns, I always had envisioned – being with my brother going to school, right? And then, you know, Mac Brown and them, all these, all these coaches were just pretty much like, no. And, and honestly, it wasn't them. I, I, I truly believe it was God redirecting my path. So I, I would say my lowest point was that constant feeling of like, I'm going to these camps. I'm working hard. I'm still behind um, these top guys who are perceived as the best receivers. Um, no one notices me. I put in all this work, and it seems as though guys who do less get more glory, so to speak. Um, I'm trying my all, and I still can't gain the weight. Um, I'm praying, and I'm being persistent, but I'm not seeing anything move, mm. right? And then I was a very, very homebody, you know, Kids are, everyone's different, right? Some people can't wait to get out the house and leave. I was very much a homebody. I loved my family. I loved being in the state of Texas. I never imagined myself leaving. And I remember we were sitting at Papa Do's actually in, in Austin. And my dad, it, this is after I like, I tried so many schools. And you, you were filling out questionnaires, <laughs> you know, height, weight. I'm like lying on, this, yeah. I'm like, oh, I'm six one. you know what I'm saying? I'm one, right. but like, all these, all these efforts I'm trying to put in, and they're all just kind of uh, getting overlooked, right? And I remember being at uh, Papa Do's restaurant, and my dad was like, hey, why don't we try uh, my alma mater and, and to East Carolina University? And we'll send it to them. We'll send their, the tape to them, and, you know, it's, we'll just see. We'll just see what happens. So I'm like, yeah, sure. I mean, at the time, what I perceived East Carolina, East Carolina was so far from me. I'm a right. young kid, like. I live in Texas, you know, I want TCU. ECU is so far fetched. And we sent them to Tate. Ruffin McNeil had called me back literally like 30 to 45 minutes later. And was like, Zay, your, your Tate just came through. We were in an offensive meeting. That's when Lincoln Riley was there. He was like, 
we just put on your tape and we watched it and we love you. We want to offer you a full scholarship to ECU. And I just remember crying, bro. I just broke down. I just started crying. And it just came out of nowhere. Like that blessing just came out of nowhere, right? And I remember just feeling like God saw me, you know, like a needle in a haystack. He saw me. And I committed to East Carolina. I waited a little bit because it was so emotional. My parents were like, just wait a second. You know, we thought maybe there would be more, but like, I still believe those those were blocked because I was supposed to go to East Carolina. So I go there, the only offer I have, um, you know, fourth, fifth on the depth chart going into training camp. And then you fast forward, I had broken two to three NCAA records and, you know, hold all these accolades and end up becoming a, a second round draft pick. I mean, I remember watching from afar and like Donnie, like he like was like all time receptions in the NCAA, like of all any college receiver you can think of. And it's like, it was very impressive to look at from afar. Like I, I went to George, like I had 51 catches in four years. <laughs> and I'm like, he probably does that in a half a season. <laughs> but now in the position that I'm in, especially just with uh, as far as my mental journey and spiritual journey, I look at that and now I want to ask like, what was your mental health journey like? in that time because I'm sure it was a lot of weight. I'm sure it was a, a burden and a blessing at the same time, perhaps. Like, mm. what was that like um, rising to that level? And um, was the not enough story still trying to chirp at you? Like, what, Matt, take us through that time. Yeah. Um, so I didn't, I didn't go into ECU saying, like, I'm going to break this record, this record. I'm going to be a Blitnikoff finalist. I didn't, I didn't do any of that. All I wanted to do was prove the people who believed in me right. Mm. That was my overall, like, theme of I wanted to make sure Lincoln Riley, Ruther McNeil, the East Carolina fan base knew that who they were getting, they were getting someone who was completely devoted and committed to this university like they had never seen before. Just because like I had that that passion built up from so much I think denial that I just wanted to pour into someone who was seeing me and witnessing me. And I just trained. I just remember I said I want to be the greatest player who ever came through the school. That's it. And I just worked like it. And it was the the incremental growth, the meticulous growth from year to year. I mean, it started with 65 catches the fresh, freshman year to 81 my sophomore year, I think, to 97 my junior year to 158 my senior year. Mm -hmm. And I remember sitting down. I remember sitting down before my senior year because we had gotten a new coaching change. And I'll never forget this. Phil McGagan, uh, who's our wide receivers coach, he brought me into his office. And he's like, hey, I've heard a lot of things about you. I want to hear it from your mouth. What type of player do you want to be? What do you want to do this year? And I told him. Like, I looked at him because there was. I, I said it with so much confidence and, and sincerity. I said, I want to win a championship. I want to be a first-team All-American. I want to catch 1,500 yards. I want 10 touchdowns. I want 150 catches. Um, I want to break some records. That's when I made those visions. And I mean, by the grace of God, I did it. I, I ended up with like 1,800 yards, like nine touchdowns, 158 catches. I was a first team All-American. Unfortunately, we didn't win a championship, but everything I set out, I don't think you can make unrealistic goals without genuine, real work ethic and vision and like making it concrete, making it these things formulate and become like actual tissue. You got to make it mesh and you got to make it raw and real. I, I don't think it's just like free floating thoughts and ideas. It's just like, yeah, I, I'll have that and I'm just supposed to have it. Like I genuinely was like, I think these things are, I deserve these things because of my persistence, the level in which I pursue them with the integrity, the steps I'm taking, uh, the work ethic I'm putting in, the training I put in, and the overall arching theme, because I believe my my Father in Heaven, my God, has a plan for me that He wants to see me succeed, and He wants the most for me. So He's going to give me something very special, and I have faith in that. So the mental journey of like Darren just elevating every single season, bro. Like freshman Zay couldn't have said what senior Zay said because it, it wasn't there yet, but just like trusting that. And that's part of that process I'm talking about. If you look at like the tra trajectory of my life, so to speak, is like that, that growth, 
that growth and then shooting up, you know. I, I still feel like it was the same way of freshman to sophomore to junior to senior. And um, entering the league, though, things changed a little bit for me. I don't, I don't know if we have time, but we can dive into that as well. Oh, no, we definitely have time. We, <laughs> we, try to, <laughs> we got time today, cuz. Okay. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, that's really the whole reason we have this platform is, you know, we see these – there's ebbs and flows the entire way of 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 great of great peaks and then there's there there's some valleys you talk about you know how you, you feel like you couldn't like buy an offer or get somebody to look at you then yeah. you become you know such a uh, just a powerful force for your team for just in college football and then you know you get to the early part of your career like take us through like some of the adversity that you faced in that early part with coming in with great expectations yeah. put on you and get, going into an environment that may not necessarily have been what one would expect it, but it's the cards you've been dealt. Like, what was that like? Yeah. Um, life really hit me fast uh, my rookie season, especially the NFL. You know how difficult it is. And so um, I still – the beautiful thing about the story of, like, everything that was so monumental to me, at least in my mind at ECU, was only the beginning of this actual journey, mm. right? And – ECU didn't get a whole lot of praise as far as like from the outside looking, outside looking in, but ECU themselves gave me so much love and supported me. And I think I can only see it now in, in retrospect when I look back at it. I think that I still had flaws and I still didn't do things the best, but I was so loved and just like welcomed and promoted and, and seen as such like, um, I hate using the word untouchable, but I, I was I was just really, really loved there. And I had so much praise. My rookie season was the first time I faced true criticism, now outside of the ECU bubble, of like I lived in this world of ECU kind of against the world in a sense because like no one, you know, it's all about what we think, which is very healthy. Mm -hmm. When you transition, though, and you don't you don't make the proper transitions mentally, which I didn't know, that was very very difficult. So when I entered my rookie season in Buffalo, um, first and foremost, to play any position on that level is difficult. I don't care who you are; the league humbles you at some point. And so, I remember getting to Buffalo. Um, you know, we had traded Sammy Watkins, we had traded Marcel. Darius, I believe, Ronald Darby, all these guys. And, like, there's so many changes going on, new staff coming in. And, you know, I didn't really know, to be honest, generally what it meant to be a number one receiver in Buffalo. I just didn't know, like, what that entailed, who you're going to be facing every week, week in and week out preparation, adapting and transferring your game. You know, like, those are just things you learn. And to be quite honest, it was really, really difficult. I had some success, but I failed a lot, a lot, and it was hard. And I tore my shoulder, I remember, um, week seven. And some of the staff, they, they knew, not everybody knew, but, like, I just thought, well, I, I got to keep playing, you know, because I'm a second-round pick, and I, I can't sit out because these games matter. I didn't even realize how long an NFL season truly was, bro. <laughs> I didn't. And now I, I caught myself kind of riding this wave of who I was at ECU that Yanni, I, I didn't reset. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Like, I, didn't, I didn't really, like, reset. It, it, I transitioned so quickly into, like, the senior bowl, to the combines, to the, the off-season workouts, and visiting, and rookie mini camp, training camp, and it just got on. I couldn't catch my breath. I didn't. I didn't reset. And then I'm now I'm facing, you know, to the likes of Morris Claiborne, Stephon Gilmore, um, Marcus Peters, Casey Hayward. You know, all of these guys. And I'm like, this is hard. You know, I, I really had. I really didn't love the game the same way anymore. You know, it's kind of like I would climbed through this this glass ceiling and like finally broke it open only to get there and realize that I'm staring at a mountain that I haven't brought all the proper tools for. Mm. That's a very defeating feeling. Mm. And I remember feeling suffocated through that season of like, it's week in and it's week out. Um, 
I finally got to the end of that season. And I was so, I was so elated for that season to be over because I was like, dude, I just need to, to rest. Um, but then I didn't rest in the right ways, right? I went down a little path of trying things I shouldn't have been trying, dabbling in situations I shouldn't have been shouldn't have been in, you know, surrounding myself with with people that I shouldn't have been in. That ended up me that that made me end up getting into trouble. I got arrested in L.A. It's actually the first time I've talked publicly about this. Um, I remember getting in trouble in L.A., and that was, to me, the, the pit right there. Um, because although, yes, it's hard and it's difficult, I just had so much growth and learning to do, and I didn't actually realize it, that I felt like I had squandered my opportunity with the Bills organization. And there were things going on that, you know, but I'll, I'll keep it more just – personal um, I felt like I had really wasted that opportunity and I felt terrible about it like these people have invested in me um, I could blame whoever I mean that's not going to help and I remember sitting in I remember sitting in jail feeling like man I really screwed up I really screwed up I was like all that for all that for how do you go from NCAA <coughs> records to you know underperforming your rookie season and in jail how does that work and so I really had to ask myself like who do you want to be as a man what type of character do you want to have and how do you want to how do you where do you want to go from here I remember coming back playing my second year I, I played pretty well I actually had seven seven touchdowns you know I, I led the team in like most of the categories as a as a receiver um but I still feel like my image was tainted a little bit. And Buffalo Bills, Buffalo Bills fans, man, like, they love their football. They support their team. But they, they don't shy away from speaking and saying how they feel. I let a lot of things infiltrate my mind. I heard a lot of outside perspective. I, I would just look at people and just – I would kind of be like, do they know? I'm, now I'm, like, paranoid, you know, walking around Buffalo. Like, do they – you know, I'm, I'm still, what, 22? I'm walking into Wegmans and like people look at me. I'm like, are they looking at me because they know I play for the Bills, or are they looking at me because I got cuts and, and scars on me and they know I've been arrested? You know, I went through a, a huge mental battle on top of what it takes to play in this league. You know, so I just had a lot going on, man. Um, I would say that, that jail was my my lowest point of like feeling that depression and feeling like. You know, people are calling me crackhead and a meth head and you do PCP and, you know, how do you have millions of dollars and you're just and it, like they didn't even know my own family situation. They, they didn't know anything that was going on. But it was like that outside perception of like, bro, you had everything and you lost it. Mm. Yeah. What were some of the tools that were missing? You talked about your your um, first season, your rookie season, that there there weren't there were tools that you did not have. What were some of those tools that maybe you've picked up? In these last few years yeah for sure I would say just how to prepare first of all how to prepare your body you know you think at 21 22 23 it's like your body's gonna run forever I mean which at that moment in time it will but there's gonna be wear and tear how to be more proactive than reactive what I mean by that is how do I get on top of preventing injuries before the injury gets there you know things like that um, mentally how to prepare your psyche for a football game. So it's not like I go to practice, I come home. I go to practice, I come home. I call it autopilot mode, which I was on because I'm like, well, I just, this is my job. I go to practice and then, you know, I mean, whatever happens, happens. They, they pay you, you go home, and you just wait until game day now, you know? And that's not how it works. I mean, if, if you live like that, you play like that, unless you're like the anomaly of 1%, you're just raw talent better than everybody who steps out. You're going to find yourself on the couch watching them very soon. So it's like the mental preparation of like, okay, I need to be tactical and have techniques about how I'm approaching this upcoming week. I need to study. I need to be more involved. I need to put people in my circle that are willing to tell me what areas of my game I lack, you know? And so it's, you know, give a kid all the catches in the world and he does so great. And now he thinks that, like, he knows everything, which is not the case. So I think you have to be confident enough to, to know I can go out here and compete. But you got to be humble enough to be like, I can still learn. You know what I'm saying? 
So I, I think just hitting on some of those would be the things that like the tools of as far as like resetting mentally what I'm going through physically. How do I need to do this now? How do I get open? How do I create separation um, instead of just thinking like it's going to happen? You know what I'm saying? What about emotional tools or things to regulate your emotions? Sure. Um, I think that talking to, uh, you know, therapists or counseling, you know, is really seen as like you're crazy or you got something wrong with you. It's not the case. You know, it's both of you guys know. And people need, especially men, need someone to talk to just to get things out in the right way and learning how to unpack what you're feeling. You know, I used to be very critical of myself of I don't feel like playing football today or maybe I don't love the game as much right now as like there's something wrong. Well, now I've realized, no, there's not anything wrong. I'm human, right? So how do I unpack that and how do, okay, you don't, maybe you don't feel completely in love with the game today. That's okay, right? What is the basis of what I need to do though? What I have to create a standard of myself of how I'm going to carry myself regardless, right? I'm going to stay within this framework and it can bend a little bit, you know, but I'm going to stay very level of how I'm going to approach my day and putting better thoughts inside and having better conversations and like not forcing myself to like, I have to feel this way or I have to, to you know what I'm saying? Like I have to have this elation of, of being here, right? Because it's like, oh, you play football. It's the most amazing job in the world. So you're just, you're supposed to be happy. You know what I'm saying? It's like, Darren, how many times have, like, bro, some days get hard. Nobody is going to be happy when four body parts on your body hurt 365 days a year. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> so, so it's like, you're supposed to be grateful. So it's like, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm supposed to be grateful. So I can't, now I can't express that. I don't got it today or whatever it is, you know? And now you feel like maybe you got to put on this, this smile or this front because now people are going to think that you, you're not happy to be here or you don't love football. Like you're not a football, football guy. You know what I'm saying? And so I had to learn that like, I can still come to work, do my job, be cordial, be loving, be grateful, and still have things that I'm processing and, and going through. And that's okay. That's completely okay. That doesn't mean now I neglect what I'm supposed to do or you know, I have an attitude towards people, but I've had more grace for myself in understanding that, like, some people may view me as, you know, a superhero or a football player. So there's, but I'm still a person and I, I still go through things and giving myself space, even within the day of time, maybe like 10, 15 minutes, just be like, bro, it's okay. It's okay to feel the way you feel. Process it, think about it pack it up, proceed forward. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know how to do that rookie season. So I thought that, you know, a lot of people have deemed my character to be like a very outgoing, um, you know, bright, fun, talkative person, which I am. But that doesn't mean I'm like that every single day. You know, like I go through things, you go through things. We all have things in our heart that like, we, maybe we struggle to, to verbalize. You know, I, I wear my heart on my sleeve. Like, you'll know when I'm sad or upset or, or madder. So it's like, dude, that's completely okay. But how do you work through that? I think that's what emotionally I have I have learned um, more so as of recently. But de definitely did not have that my, my rookie season. I mean, it, this is the essence of loving yourself yeah. and self-love. And, yeah. and also having the awareness of, this core wound of the not enough story, which it sounds like was was there, right? Yeah, Growing yeah, up high yeah. school, and then you have this image of perfection you have to meet, but perfect isn't even real. Yeah. So then you're constantly validating the not enough story, trying to be perfect, and days you're banged up and want to rest, and your mind is saying you need to do more. Yeah, yeah. But the key, you've said it multiple times, um, for anybody else listening, what, whatever, if you have an unwanted emotion coming up, you're not feeling worthy, if you're feeling inadequate, or you may be messed up, to say it's okay. Yeah. That's the piece. There's an acronym STOP, which is like, I'll use it as a pattern interrupt for coaching clients, which is the S is for stop, the T is for take three breaths, the O is for observe what's happening. Mm -hmm. Like 
come into your body, scan your body, and the P is proceed. Yeah. Proceed with love and kindness or love and compassion where you can say, it's okay to feel this. Yeah. I'm not weak. I'm not afraid. I'm not fucked up yeah, yeah. for feeling this. It's yeah. okay. Yeah. I'm a human being. Definitely. That is like such a radical piece of the, the self-compassion aspect that I think so many people are missing, especially men. Yeah. I mean, I think you, you said everything. You, yeah, you just said it. I completely agree with you. Dude, it's like, it's like, if you think of the essence of like a commitment. I feel like a commitment is um, the choice or the response to continue to press on or persevere, like even when your desire to do so it has like subsided yeah. or it's yeah, gone yeah. away. Like, there's no like we're gonna experience a wide range of emotions no matter what we do, whether it's football, whether it's our craft, whether it's meditation, whether it's anything that involves uh, a practice uh just progress over time where it's a continued showing up and doing of things like requiring ourselves to be in this perfect emotional state is unrealistic and Dude, really unhealthy completely but it's more so about your response to adversity your response to how somebody else may treat you it's responding in a way that's indicative of your character even when you know, I don't even really want to act this way. I don't even really want to hold myself to this standard on this day, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah. And how else can that commitment really be tested other than, you know, to go through something? Yeah. And I know you said I said everything, but I feel like you said everything mm -hmm. in that last um, series of um, conversations that you just had. I mean, there's so much I want to bring up, like going back to your values, like I believe that you are who you are today and you are where you are because of your values, mm -hmm. like you just um, embody and are like resonating, really embodying just solid core values. Yeah. And it, it even goes back to the goals that you set to your college coach, which all of those goals for people that are trying to set goals and you're not achieving them. Sometimes we set goals, but they're not based on our own core values. Yeah. You have to know your core values. You better know who you are before you set those goals because oftentimes we're setting goals around what um, the world thinks, what our family thinks. And yeah. it's like, we have to know who we are. And also it's important for all human beings, but especially you guys with just being infiltrated by so much external noise and people wanting your attention and trying to yeah. pull you off your center is boundaries. Yeah. You have to know your values to set boundaries because a boundary is getting crossed when a value gets stepped on. But if you don't know your values, right, you're gonna just going to let people walk all over you all the time. So there's just so much there. And I just really um, want to acknowledge you for your values and what a gift. And I don't think so much of it comes from faith and this process of life and this journey that's led you to this moment right here. Thank you very much. I mean, you saying that means a lot. I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's very clear. <clears throat> One thing I definitely want to talk about is, um, you know, when you were here and just us becoming friends, like, yeah. um, you know, I just at practice in the building, like I would just like watch you and watch how you moved and just like was in awe of you because you were like incredibly undervalued when you were here. Uh, I'll come out and say, it, I don't give a <laughs> <laughs> man, the man was incredibly undervalued, but you still showed up to work every day and you were the hardest working person on the team. I mean, it'd be if you and Max were 1A, yeah. 1B, I might put myself like two, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. and um, it was just incredible because every day it was um, probably reminders in your head of like, man, this is not like the situation I would prefer. And especially with the way that I work mm -hmm. and the way that I produce when I'm given opportunities on this practice field, mm -hmm. like, how do you show, how did you show up? Like, what was the key to having a good mindset? Because I feel like a lot of people listening maybe in a situation where it's like, man, I feel undervalued or I don't feel like I'm getting yeah. the respect I deserve, opportunities I deserve. Like, how would you help them in, in their process? Yeah, yeah. Um, gosh, that's a lot. I'm like trying to process. I think it simply came down to, okay, you're not being valued or used the way that you want to, right? That's completely... You, I understand that. Now, how do I act? Who does it affect? And, and really, like, the core values, who do I want to be? And if I started letting, you know, coaches' opinions about me or where they see me truly dictate me, well, now they've thrown me off because 
now I'm latching on to more of what they say, and it could send me in a couple of directions. Right? It could send me in a tank, and I can feel sorry for myself. It could, and now I, I would never achieve what I would like to achieve. It can make me angry, and now I become a cancer to those around me. Now people don't want to be around me. You know what I'm saying? Because of my attitude and what it radiates. It's like now every time they're around Zay, it's like, yeah, dude, he's cool, but like, bro, he just, he's, it's something about, he's just, it's just negative. It just brings me down. You know what I'm saying? So I really had to evaluate, okay, truly, is this all about me? Once I get out of my way, now I can see things from a greater perspective, which is not, you know, and I think oftentimes if you're struggling, maybe you're seeing everything solely about you. So I try to go in, I try to have a balance with this. So I don't want to be hypocritical, but like I go in waves where I got to protect myself and I do have to be a little bit selfish in order to pour into other people. And there's moments when things are just so frustrating and I'm feeling unseen and I'm not feeling heard, which is like, dude, not everything's about you. So then I had to realize building bonds with you guys and it being organic helped me so much because now I know, I know Darren's story. You don't think Darren wants to be great? You don't think that he's worked too? Why can't you support him because it's his time right now? Hmm. Why don't you love him, you know, and this is his moment. You don't think Derek Carr hasn't been through a whole lot? The seasons that's he, that he's had with the Raiders, he's been through just as much as you, Zay. It may have looked differently, but he's been through just as much as you. Why can't you support him in his time? Yeah. You look at Foster. You know, look at Max. Look at Alec Engel. Why can't you be the best possible teammate you can for them? Because ultimately, if you can do that and you receive no glory, that says a lot about you. Mm. And then it also you got to think, who are you serving when you're doing it, right? If you're serving men's expectations and if you're serving, you know, fans and coaches and things like that, well, then, dude, you're going to be tossed all over the place because that's fickle. That changes all the time, right? But if, you're, if your eyes and your heart are set on, like, you know what, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you. I'm going to focus, focus on you. I'm going to give you everything I have. And whether the blessing comes now, five years, mm -hmm. two years, ten years, or never, I still know that I did it with a pure heart and intention to love those around me and ultimately love you. That is a way better place to live than walking in the building and like looking at the script and being like, bro, I don't got one pass for me here today. So I'm just, I don't, whatever, bro. Mm. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk around and like kind of be upset and pissed off. And like the first sign of like, cause you know what sneaks back in now that arrogance and pride, you know what it does now it's like, they're out to get me. Victim. Right? Victim mode. Right? They're out to get me. Oh, I, I know he never liked me. So, I mean, it just, that's how it was supposed to go. Now, there are some real circumstances of people who had, like, really, really bad break, like, or whatever it is. But, like, if you take the victim role, bro, that doesn't help. It really doesn't. I, I agree. Let's, I'll, I'll tell, you know, my my siblings or my friends or whoever it is, I'm like, okay, bro, let's have a pity party for five minutes, and then let's talk about how, you know. So I had to really, really work through that, and that's a daily thing you have to do, right? And I remember there would be moments like that needle in the haystack where I was like, when I was like, God sees me. There would be moments. I remember Coach Gruden. Um, I remember Coach Gruden had called me in on one play in practice. It was this, this one specific uh, route. Um, it was like from a nasty split. We would, what's the one where we ran like 18 to 20 yards and we like shut it down immediately. It was like a, like almost like a lock or something like that. I don't know if you remember, but anyways, there was this one specific route that, uh, you know, kind of guys were struggling on or for whatever reason, like we just weren't hitting. And I remember practicing this route. I didn't do it in front of anybody. I practiced it just because I was like, I think that's a good route for me. You know, I got good length, good speed. But it wasn't for me. It was meant for somebody else. Um, I think it was meant for like uh, I won't even. It's not. It's not. It's not important. Gruden called me in and was like, "Give me Zay Jones." 
<laughs> Zay, come on in. Get me Zay Jones. Zay, come on <laughs> here and run this route, man. Let's see what you got, man. Don't mess it up, bro. I, I'm telling you. <laughs> and then, uh, dude, bro, we broke the huddle. I, I had practiced it, so there's no reason for me to to be fearful. And Derek threw it, and I caught it. And it's like that wasn't like a spectacular moment to anybody else, but I remember that, right? So that validated right there that because you were prepared, you know, because you you didn't worry about, I could have had a terrible attitude. It was like, that route's not for me, so why am I going to practice it? Well, that's stupid. They got him on it, so like, I mean, I'm, it's never going to come to me. What if they would have called me and I never would have practiced it, and then I missed that opportunity? And so there are little things throughout, you know, my season and my life that, that like, those glimpses that validated what I was doing was correct. And then we get to Monday night against Baltimore, mm. and we're playing. I caught one ball, I think, before the first half was over. That was it. I didn't get another ball until overtime came. And I just remember being like, we're going to win this game. I'm supporting my teammates. I'm supporting Henry, Brian, uh, Hunter, you know, just doing the best I can. I'm blocking, right? the blocking receiver, the the clear out receiver. And we get in the bunt stack and Derek audibles, cover zero, he sees it. And I beat uh, Marlon Humphrey and I, I catch the ball in overtime and the stadium erupts, Monday night football against Baltimore. And everything was validated for how my teammates embraced me in that moment. You know what I'm saying? Like they showed me love you know because I felt like I had been giving and pouring out but like they showed me love in that in that moment and that was just one one moment like I could talk about a lot of moments like that but those consistent days of stacking I think I know it's long-winded I can talk no, forever no, but bro. keep going that's that's the mindset you should carry I know it's it's hard it's difficult I'm not like I haven't mastered it by any sort of sense like it's still a, a daily thing for me but like Dude, what place would you rather live? Would you rather live in a world where you're supporting and loving people and, and waiting for your opportunity and it's going to come? You just got to stay patient. Or do you want to play victim and think that the world doesn't love you and there's nothing out there for you? I mean, I'd rather live in a world with hope than one feeling empty. Bro, what you're saying is so good right now, bro. Like, and and seeing what your life has become now, uh, I heard this quote recently from a, uh, a pastor, uh, shot at Jerry Flowers, dude be preaching fire. <laughs> Talk, but ask cuz <laughs> but he said if service is beneath you leadership is beyond you yeah that's real if service is beneath you leadership is beyond you and you see i see it as we talk about faith we talk about god right yeah. he's observing us he is with us and he sees the way that you conduct yourself in these environments when it's not necessarily catered to you it's not necessarily catered to you know what's best for you and, and the best fit for you, but he sees the way that you conduct yourself. He knows that there's a foundation in place for you to be able to handle the success that you have now. Mm. And I don't, I think a lot of people want to skip those steps. Yeah, sure. You know, I had the, I had moments just like you. I was in Baltimore. I got reinstated and put on practice squad. We drafted Mark Andrews and dude was balling from day one. Mm. And, that, and I had, I still had some envy in my heart. I was still sure, trying to yeah, get, yeah. get right, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, Mentally yeah. and spiritually. So I still had those things in my heart. And uh, I remember when, when God finally reached me and was like, support this dude, like yeah. gas this dude, like, yeah. and just, you know, how much that made me feel better about myself in return, yeah. the overall respect I had for myself and supporting this man. And that allowed me to have an opportunity to where, you know, I can actually show up and have relationships with you guys and it actually means something. It's yeah, not like bro. me trying to, you know, impress you or have you on my side so I can just have a lit Instagram and I have dudes on, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that's that, that happens. <laughs> you know what I'm that saying? Happens. So it's like I've had these moments and now I look back from the position I'm in through the highs and the lows, like moments where I had to be humbled and moments where, you know, truly being about service. And the more I make this about enriching the life of somebody else and supporting somebody else, how it comes back to me, like, it's a biblical principle for yeah. Christians out there, like, mm -hmm. and really just a way to to live life. Because when it's all about me, my world just becomes smaller and yeah. smaller and yeah. smaller and smaller. But yeah. when it's about other people and making this world a better place, making any environment I'm in a better place, my world gets larger. Yeah. And there's more for me to come in because God knows it's not just gonna get to me and stop, it's gonna be able to get through me sure. and be passed on to somebody else. So just know, bro, I, every time I look at you, I see that you are a true embodiment, bro. bro I, Likewise, bro. 
you inspire me, bro, daily. You know that. I love this. I feel like I should slide back. <laughs> <laughs> no, bro, get some of this love, man. It's amazing. I mean, you don't have to be an NFL football player to um, resonate with this message. Mm. I hear early on high school going on these recruiting trips with your brother, a lot of victim mindset. Yeah. Right. And it's, that's the shift. This is the essence of comeback stories. The only story that matters is the one you tell yourself. So if you're telling yourself I'm getting screwed, nobody loves me. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, coaches out to get me full on victim mentality. No, there's no growth in that space. Mm -hmm. It's like, what's the lesson? Who am I here to serve? And, you know, we talk about service all the time. This is true service, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Not like serving with a hidden agenda mm -hmm. or like being fake about it. Like yeah. true service, which yeah. is ultimately the antidote. If you're in a funk, um, if you're having a tough time, like just go help. Mm -hmm. Go help somebody because then you're not going to be thinking about your shit or the, the woe is me story. Mm -hmm. And it still is the easier, softer way than playing the victim or trying to control things you can't control or giving your power away to your coaches. Yeah. It's like, this is how you take your power back. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, the truth is undefeated, man. And if you can live with truth, um, living in truth, and walking with truth, and it may not be what you envision, but it's gonna be worth it. Mm. It's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be powerful. It's going to be far more rewarding than what you could have ever imagined. There are moments that I've had, e the Raiders and even the Jags, that like I could not have envisioned them in the way that they've came. And I didn't, I didn't sketch it. I didn't, I didn't <laughs> plan that. Uh, that was truly by the mercy and gift from God. And if you can walk the best you can, you're not going to be perfect. If you can walk the best you can in truth, serving those around you, living genuine doing things with no hidden agenda as we speak of, spoke of. Um, be cordial, be hardworking, be determined. Face yourself, face your demons, look in the mirror, ask yourself the tough questions. I mean, that's that's the life that, that I'm trying to op uphold myself to and, and walk in. Um, I just, I feel as though it's far more rewarding to live that way than to live in a world where you think everything is about you and you're supposed to have it this way. I l actually enjoy now the surprises of life and, and what they bring and what God has in store because he shows up, man. Things look bleak. It's like a movie. Things look <laughs> bleak. It's like, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And then you get through it and you're like, man. Every time. God is good. You know what I'm saying? You, it's just that, that real genuine refreshing, like, dang, God is good, bro. Those are moments that, that, that mean the most to me. So I'm just grateful be in this position and now grateful to be with the Jags yeah. I wanted to say earlier that I don't think you were the only one undervalued on your on your team that year or <laughs> years following this is me speaking yeah 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 what would you say you're 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 you sound and embody this faith in your practices rituals what do those look like today like we always talk about morning routines and consistencies we had Mark Groves on mm -hmm. a few weeks ago and I asked him what the definition of self-love was and he mm -hmm. said routines rituals and habits mm -hmm. And really sticking with those, what what do your practices look like? Do you have a morning routine, meditation, prayer? Like, what are your non-negotiables these days? It's a really good question. Um, more centered around prayer and reading the Word and having God-centered people around you, I think is would be mine. Um, definitely staying in, in contact with with Lord, but aligning your prayer with His will. Um, oftentimes, I think. Um, you know, we want things for us to be done. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with coming and asking God for the desi desires of your heart. But do the, do the desires of your heart align with his plan and his will? So for me recently, it's kind of been like, okay, Lord, help me put, put, you know, your eyes and your lens over mine. What do you desire? What do you want? And how do the things that I would like, okay, what's the root of, of why I want them? Right. That's tough. Intention. Yeah. Because I tell you sometimes, bro, it's hard because it's like I want it because and then it's kind of like shame. Like, mm. uh, you know, why I want it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so it's like it's like, OK, so help me. Mm. Help me in those areas. Lord, help me with my unbelief in areas that I struggle with. You know, help um, me sift through what I'm going through. So I think definitely prayer, but also listening, listening to God and reading. 
reading his word, um, oftentimes we speak to God, but do we listen? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Um, and these are areas I can grow in, in all of them. So I'm not saying like I'm completely perfect. Uh, but then having conversations and having, having people who will hold you accountable to the things that you say, I think are very, very key. Um, I have good friends and great God-fearing men um, in my circle. And none of them are perfect, but we can have honest conversation with each other, you know, without it being offensive or like, that's what I'm saying, like walking with truth, you know. And so those would kind of be the things that are centered um, for me day to day. Um, I have not done any specific sort of meditation, but I think a lot of things in a lot of forms can be meditation. So, um, breathing exercises, holding in for a four, or breathing in for a four count, holding it for two, pushing it out. I do that often, even before I play, you know. But um, taking moments of recognition of being alive and what that means, being grateful, practicing gratitude, I think oftentimes puts things in perspective for you, or at least for me it does. Um, reaching out to those I love, telling them I love them, thinking about them, and then acting on it. And actually praying for the people I say I'm going to pray for, mm. you know, like now I'm going on a tangent. Mm -hmm. but like, no, bro, I'm going to pray for you. But like, do you actually get on your knees and pray for them? Do you actually, you know, do you try to speak life into them? Um, those are just the things, I, uh, the rituals, so to speak, I, I think I'm, I'm trying to practice. Yeah. What would you say to somebody that is resonating with our conversation, but is str still struggling with the God thing? Uh, I mean, a lot of people still struggle. Dude, I have so many questions still. So it's like we, Same. we like Same. no one person has it all figured out. Um, but I would say pursue, pursue actually what the truth is, not the truth. You tell yourself, oh, this is true. Well, OK, well, you know, if, if I said your shirt is is yellow and, and you were like, no, my shirt is this color. Well, can they be? I, I don't pursue actual truth, solid foundation of what truth is. You know what I'm saying? Um, study. Put forth effort. Search. Seek. Seek who God says he is. Not who someone on you saw on Instagram said or someone on YouTube said. Seek for your own eyes who the character of who God says he is. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Um Ask questions. Be ask a lot of questions. You know, continuously ask those. Continuously ask those questions. Um, I'm not. I'm not like a. What is it? Like a. I don't know. I don't know the, the proper term that I'm searching for. I guess I'm not a pastor. Evangelist. Yeah. yeah. I think we go out evangelize in our own ways. I'm not like a, a person who has all every single knowledge about doctrine and everything like that. But you know what? I search and I look. And I ask I ask questions. I surround myself with good people who are honest with me and we share the same core values and belief and be like, okay, this is not just some free floating thought idea. There's actual evidence for it. Uh it, it's it, it's been documented. You know, we're moving in, in a direction of you know, why our faith is in this area, you know, things like that. So I would I would say just just keep searching. Yeah. Something I would add to that is um I always struggled in my relationship with God was like, you know, my grandfather's a pastor, um, my great grandma, my cousin in the building, you know how they get down. They 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 prayer warriors and they got all the all the big prayer words and whatnot. But one thing I realized for me was if I'm seeking God, like I don't need to have all the thighs and the vows and these eloquent prayers, like talk to him real. Like come from authenticity. Living like truth. I'm hurting, like <laughs> yeah. I'm struggling, like I feel like a slave to this. Yeah. I feel like I feel weak in this. Like I don't know what to do here. Like if you come before God like that instead of saying, you know, thou holiest of like if that's how you get down, that's how you get down. But right. if you're formulating your words in a way to try to impress with your prayer or to make it sound good, mm -hmm. as opposed to it if you come in come bleeding, come hurting, come confused, yeah. come hurt, like come as you are. And I feel like if you're seeking that, 
whatever that higher power looks like in your life, if, if it's God, whatever it is, like you're more likely to meet with it if you come as you really are because I don't think he's going to bless who you think you are or who you um, think you want to be. He's going to bless and work with and walk with exactly who you are. Yeah. It's almost like the how acronym taking that approach, which what I heard and you said it earlier, you said it, but honesty, like getting honest. And we know in the world of recovery, really it's in any kind of self-help, personal development. Like if you can't get honest, there's no chance. Yeah. There's no chance. You, you got to get honest. You gotta start there. But even from a faith standpoint, whatever you choose to believe, that open-minded is the, the, the O in the how acronym. Mm-hmm. You got to be open-minded. Mm-hmm. If you think your way where a lot of people have been conditioned, maybe they were brought up in one faith and there's just even trauma there because maybe they saw their parents preaching one thing but living a different way. Yeah, so there's yeah. just so mm-hmm. much confusion there. They were told something, you know, that it didn't real didn't align with the actions that they were seeing. Yeah. And then the W is willingness. And that's I think that willingness to get curious. Like to to get curious and to to um listen. Mm-hmm. You know, listen to the signs. I believe for me it's like God speaks through the mouths of other people. Mm. That's where I hear. Mm. That's where I hear the spirit, the signs the most, mm. right? It's like through the mouths, and this is why it's important to listen. Mm-hmm. And it's also important why it's to be present, because if you're not present, um, you're gonna miss the message. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, dude, I love this conversation. I could really talk about this all day. I, I would also tell people like, what's your standard of truth to? Mm. Right. The the God of the Bible that I know. Yahweh is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so that's not changing. And so what's your standard of truth? Is it social media? Well, that changes every day. Mm. That's fickle. That's a, I mean, <laughs> more power to you if that's the way you want to go. Is, 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 it, is it the internet? You know, like, what, what do you have to base your truth off of? Whatever it is for you, if that's your standard, okay, live by that. Walk it out. You know what I'm saying? And so, yeah, I, I would. That's just some advice that I would I would offer to someone who's like, well, what's the whole God thing? You know. What would be your advice to somebody that's just struggling right now? They're stuck. They know they're stuck, but they don't know what to do about it. What would you say to them? That's a great question. This is the hot seat. <laughs> you're, 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 you got ice in your veins in that seat right now. Um. I mean, the, I think the easiest answer would be like, yes, ask for help, but how, right? Is that, is that, more, is that more so? Who's struggling? Um, find someone that you admire and like. Maybe not what they have, but, you know, more so who they are, right? Talk to that person. Ask them questions. Shadow that person. Like I said, surround yourself with good people. Surround yourself with people who are wiser than yourself, who have lived longer, who know things. Um, be mindful of your surroundings. You know what I'm saying? Um, I think that's crucial to to getting. Fortunately enough for me, I had a, a great dad. Like I said earlier, great parents that when I was stuck or I needed help, those are the people that I went to. I know not everybody has that, but there are I mean, there are access to mentors and, and things of that sort. So I would say definitely try to find someone that you can emulate um, in a healthy, respective way to try to put yourself in a position. Like I would say for anyone struggling with addiction or things that, that they battle, Look at someone who's overcame it and walks in a pure and graceful way and who's a sh- still a strong leader. Pick their brain. Ask them. <laughs> Bug them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, make them tell you, like, okay, I need a break. You know what I'm saying? Like, find someone that you admire um, and that perfect person. And I, I know who a, a perfect person is, too. Yeah. yeah. That's what I would say. We ain't meant to live life alone. You're supposed to be amongst people. Yeah, community. You're supposed to be walking this thing out mm-hmm. uh, together. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Community. <laughs>
Yeah, man, thank you for coming on. I don't know what I was expecting, but I wasn't expecting this. And just <laughs> um, I feel like we could go all day. The level of depth, um, again, the faith, just uh, what you embody, it, it should be acknowledged. <laughs> um, and it was a blessing to have you on with us today. Thank you. Thank you both, man. This is so great. Yeah. I really enjoyed this. I appreciate you guys. Yeah, love you, dog. Love you more. All right, we're out of here.